I'm Alan Fenn at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and this is lecture number 10, Monopole Phased Array Field Characteristics in the Focus Near Field Region. This lecture is part of the lecture series Adaptive Antennas and Phased Arrays. Here's the course content breakdown by topic. This is lecture number 10. We'll be covering some phased array theory. We'll be describing some antenna measurement techniques. We'll be taking into account array mutual coupling and we'll be discussing both far field and near field characteristics. And the book Adaptive Antennas and Phased Arrays for Radar and Communications, Chapter 10, corresponds to this lecture. And so the purpose of this lecture is to describe the focus near field polarization characteristics of monopole phased arrays. Here's an outline of the talk. After a brief introduction and background, I'll describe the theory some results, and then summarize. And so by way of introduction, adaptive phased array antenna systems have been explored extensively by numerous researchers since the 1950s. And the primary functions of a phased array antenna system are to provide rapid beam steering, sometimes with multiple phase centers, and in many cases with low side lobes. In this lecture, we're going to be talking primarily about the antenna characteristics. So a phased array antenna aperture would consist typically of two or more transmitting or receiving antenna elements that can be used to form a directional radiation pattern. This slide shows a phased array antenna aperture in the spherical coordinate system where we're showing the polarizations for the array. In the far field, we normally talk about just the E theta and E phi components. But in the near field, we have to talk about the radial component as well. And that's what we'll be discussing in this lecture. Now the application in mind is a space-based radar in low altitude orbit. And for this type of system, in lecture number nine, we talked about a monopole array that provided a null looking straight down at the Earth and had maximum gain toward the horizon. And so a monopole array provides this type of coverage. This slide shows a monopole phased array antenna, which has a shaped elevation pattern and is omnidirectional in azimuth. Here's a photograph of a monopole array, and this was described in detail in lecture number nine. This shows a sketch of the monopole array. So the monopoles typically have a length of a quarter wavelength. Now typically to analyze a monopole phased array, we use an equivalent dipole array to represent the monopole array. We use the method of images to replace the monopole array over a ground plane with an equivalent dipole array in free space, as shown here on the right. That makes the analysis easier. In lecture four, we analyze the focus near field adaptive nulling characteristics of a monopole array, and that's shown here. In that array, we had 32 monopoles in a linear array we had three auxiliary elements spread across the array. And Lecture 9 described the design of monopole phased arrays. In Lecture 4, we showed radiation patterns before and after nulling in the near field and in the far field. And so before nulling, we had a main beam and we had side lobes. And this shows at a focal distance in the near field 1.5 aperture diameters compared to range distance of infinity. And here we show the focal distance of two aperture diameters compared to focal distance of infinity. This is before nulling. Then we introduce a jammer or, a, or an interferer at 40 degrees, and we form a null at that angle. And we concluded that near field and far field patterns are nearly equivalent. And so these simulations were for the E theta component of a monopole array. And so what we'd like to show is that the radial component of the electric field can be ignored by the analysis which follows. So let's now describe the theory. Here are some definitions. Here we're showing the monopole array in the rectangular coordinate system. And we're going to be describing the E theta component and the radial component of the electric field. We'll also be describing the tangential component of the electric field, E sub x, 
and the normal component electric field EZ. And we'll be looking at the electric field along an observation line in the near field of the antenna versus distance away from the antenna. So the near field of the nth equivalent dipole ray element can be calculated in closed form by assuming a sinusoidal current function on the dipole. And so we can calculate the Z component of the electric field as shown here and the radial component of the electric field as shown here. We can then calculate the X and Y components of the electric field from the radial component of the electric field as shown here. Now the near field of the equivalent dipole array can be computed by summing up the contributions from all n elements of the array as shown here. We can get the x, y, and z components by superposition. Now the components of the near field and far field of the equivalent dipole array can be computed as follows. In the principal plane cut, phi equals zero for a linear array of z-directed monopoles the Y component of the electric field is zero. And now the near field radial and theta components can be calculated as shown here. And in the far field, the radial component is zero. And it follows from equation one. We can calculate the Z component of the far field as shown here from the X component of the electric field. Now substituting equation three into equation two, we can calculate the theta component of the far field from the x component of the electric field divided by the cosine of theta. This slide shows an equivalent circuit model used for the mth array element in the monopole array. We have a voltage generator at the mth element with a generator impedance z sub m g and the current i sub m flows through this circuit and in the method of moments we want to determine these currents. This slide shows the method of moments formulation used for the finite vertical dipole array used to analyze the performance of the monopole array. So in the method of moments, the tangential electric field must be set equal to zero at the mth dipole element, as shown here. The dipole currents are assumed to be of piecewise sinusoidal form. We want to solve for the terminal currents of each of the elements. The basis and testing functions are sinusoidal. And we calculate the scattered field at the mth element of the array in terms of this free space Green's function, G, as shown here. And using the boundary condition and integrating over the testing function at the mth dipole, we get the following expression, which can be reduced to the following relation, V sub M is equal to summation over the n elements of the terminal currents times the complex mutual impedance between the mth and nth elements. We can write this in matrix form as V equals ZI and when we invert the impedance matrix we can then solve for the currents by multiplying the inverse of Z times V. This gives us the desired dipole array element currents. Let's show some results. So this slide shows the geometry for the monopole array and near field components. We'll be looking on the observation line in front of the array. We'll be looking at the EZ and EX components as well as the ER, the radial and E theta components. So for focus one aperture diameter from this monopole array, we compute the following field components. The EX and EZ components are very similar and if we convert these rectangular components to E theta and E R components over angle instead of position X, we see that the radial component is 19.1 dB down from the E theta component. And now if we move to 1.5 aperture diameters away from the monopole array, we see again that the EX and EZ components are similar, although EX is stronger than EZ. And now the radial component is down by minus 22.2 dB from the E theta component. So what we're seeing as we move farther from the array that the radial component gets weaker. Now we move to two aperture diameters and again now we're seeing that the radial component has dropped to minus 24.5 dB below the E theta component. Eventually as we get to the far field the radial component would be extremely weak.
And in this slide, we summarize the radial and normal components for different focal distances for the 32 element array scanned to minus 30 degrees. And so we see that the radial component starts at minus 19.1 dB when we're one diameter away from the array and it drops to minus 24.5 dB when we're two diameters away. Whereas the ratio of the EZ component to EX component stays fairly constant. This slide shows a comparison of the exact and approximate near field component for the focus monopole array. So we're scanning the beam to minus 30 degrees and we're focusing at either one or two aperture diameters. The approximate calculation assumes that the radial component is negligible whereas the exact calculation takes into account the actual value of the radial field component. So we do see that at one aperture diameter and two aperture diameters away from the monopole array that the exact and approximate calculated patterns are very, very similar. Now we compare the near field components for the focus monopole array when we scan the beam to minus 45 degrees and 50 degrees keeping the focal distance at one aperture diameter. And we see that the radial component is below 20 dB for both scan angles. So we can conclude from these simulations that the radial component of the electric field of a monopole array is negligible in the focus near field region. So in summary, the near field components of a near field focus monopole phased array antenna have been quantified. And the radial component of the near field focus monopole phased array is negligible compared to the vertically polarized component when the focal distance is in the range of one to two aperture diameters. The reference, chapter 10 of adaptive antennas and phased arrays for radar and communications has additional information to supplement this lecture.